to have this achievement in my life, like with my mom to watch it, like I could see the excitement on her, like it's just like yeah, a special day for sure, like best day of my career. I just uh, still can't believe that I really confused about how to play short stack in tournament, and I not have much experience like set, set guys, right? But seeing everything goes the right way. So I still can't believe it. I'm so excited. Maybe miracle happen. In a month's time, a selection of the world's greatest poker players will compete with the smartest businessmen in the world in the richest buy-in poker event the world has ever seen. I'm talking about Triton Million London, a one million pound buy-in event. Can you imagine how it feels to pay one million pound to play in a poker tournament and to raise so much money for charity? We're here at Las Vegas, Nevada, the home of poker, to find out. It's something that's remarkably unique about this tournament that a lot of professional players aren't going to be happy about is that this tournament isn't just, hey, you're the best play poker player in the world, you get to come play. The businessmen get to choose who they want as their teammate. It just makes a great tournament where a lot of businessmen who wouldn't play normally will play. I think that's what this event does. It brings a lot, all, a lot of mutual incentives together. The business people that play this game, they're ultra-intelligent, ultra-successful people from other areas in life. And I think more focus should be given on the businessmen who are basically just giving money away. It's quite nostalgic how I would be able to invite Sam Trickett, who started off at my casino just till dawn, playing one pound, two pound games, and now we're going to play a one million pound buy-in together. A lot of big games, if you look at it, can only exist, or they only even thrive if someone comes in and, uh, and give something. If you wind up with 40 players or more total or something, it just winds up being a great turnout. In this event, there are so many businessmen who play so much poker and who love poker so much and are so good. For example, Talal, he loves playing online. Because I'm playing for the competition, I like to play the toughest games that I can. And the toughest games are usually the big buy-in games, naturally enough. Harry has probably more wins in the last three years than any other pro except Bonamos. I'm a businessman. I love dealing in business. And one thing I found in the high stakes games is the players, um, there's a lot of things they're doing that you can copy. And there's a lot of things you can do that you can counter. So the best way to learn this game is to play against players that are better than yourself. Traditionally, it's been the case that business people have been the, the prey, as it were, to the pros. But I don't think that is always true. You know, I don't think the edges are uh, as big as people think, especially in a big buying event, because the businessmen aren't going to take money into consideration as much as pros. Business people sometimes are used to handling and dealing with large amounts of money. To me, the, the absolute best pros probably have a lack of respect for money and probably don't have a lot of money. It makes them a great player at the table, but then in, in real life, they're probably very generous. They probably spend a ton of money. Ideally, when we make decisions, we don't look at the amount of money, but the quality of the decisions. We don't let emotions affect our judgment in a bad way. I don't care how wealthy you are, if you're in a million dollar buy-in, it's going to be in the back of your mind. It's going to affect your play. The play in general is going to be tighter. These stakes matter, and they matter to me. They matter to a lot of the other players, and you're going to see that. The best players in the world aren't necessarily playing mid-stakes or low-stakes, they're playing the highest game in the room. I haven't played many tournaments the last few years, but I kind of miss this one. So this tournament is like, people have asked me, like my parents, how do you feel, are you excited? And I tried best to describe it to them, actually. I said, it's almost like a World Cup final, like it's something that you could never dream of as a kid. It's going to be the biggest day of gambling I've ever had by far. It's literally the biggest buying tournament ever, and I'm there, so that makes me really happy because that's kind of been the way I rank myself against other players for my whole career. I will never participate in something like this again. Never have before. 
likely never will again. It is just going to be such a unique experience. Like I said, I've played poker over a decade. This is the first time I've ever witnessed, any of us have witnessed anything like this. Everybody's gambling for huge sums of money. The biggest poker prize ever in history. It's pretty insane, like it's 19 million pounds for first. The experience of playing this tournament is a once in a lifetime occurrence. I think back of what, you know, 16 year old Justin would think and I know he would just be so excited to see that he would be playing this event one day. By far the most prestigious event I've ever played and I just can't wait to get in there. I love the competition. I love competing against the best in the world and just treat it like it's fun and have a good time and that's my best day. Oh, how would it feel to win this? That's probably gonna be the greatest feeling in poker history. You wanna win this high roller tournament, you're gonna have to get through me if you wanna do it. Uh, winning a freeze out with all the best players in the world and all the best amateurs in the world at the highest stakes doesn't get much better than that. Action on Vivek Rajkumar, who was facing a raise of 8,000 from Tom Dwan's two queens, and he picks a heck of a time to three bet to 35,000 with seven eight suited. As Elton Sang looks down at an ace king behind and four bets it to 100 smooth. Both Dwan and Rajkumar make the call, 300,000 into the middle, and look at this flop. Jack nine deuce, gut shot straight flush draw for Vivek. And the over pair for Dwan, which is downed on the turn after a round of checks. Vivek making the flush. Zhang folding the nut flush draw and two overs to the 210K bet. And now back over to Dwan, who's got the over pair and the Queen of Diamonds using a time bank before eventually settling on the call. An ace happens to hit the end. Would have been trouble for Zhang if he was still in there. And now it's decision time for Dwan facing a 350K riverbed. Torching off multiple time banks. But better to torch off time banks than it is to burn 350K. To reduce the diamonds. The shot clocks in this poker tournament are unique. They are quite fast pre-flop, and you get a little more time per street. You get 20 seconds before the flop, 25 seconds on the flop, 30 seconds on the turn, and then 30 seconds on the river. Now that may sound like quite a lot of time, but 30 seconds whizzes by so fast. If, say, you make a bet and an opponent has put you all in on the river, 30 seconds feels like two seconds. You have to think about hundreds of different elements into this poker hand, down to what your cards are, what your side card is. Do you have a physical tell on this person? If you take a little more time, will they give off something? What is the price you're getting? So you have to consider the math element, the human element, and under all of this, you have to have a clear enough head to do this in under 30 seconds. It's gonna be really, really extreme whenever you're playing for a million pounds. For the first six levels of play on day one, the professionals and the non-professionals will be separated, eventually merging on level seven. It's great for them that they get to play the first six levels against one another because they get to work the edge off. So once you work off those butterflies, you generally will start to think clearer, you'll, you'll take time. So that adjustment period, I, I actually think, is gonna be quite crucial for these guys. For someone like me, it obviously creates an environment where I wouldn't otherwise be playing. I think it's gonna be interesting to see what some guys that aren't used to that, uh, how they adjust. It's gonna be fun. I look forward to battling with these guys. I battle with them all the time. I may be in a pot against one of my best friends in the world, but if I draw a hand that I have to bluff with, you'll see me bluff with it. So I'm not afraid of anybody. Like, I'm just here to fight. Once level seven comes in, it's gonna be really, really interesting because it's gonna get much better for one side and much, much worse for the other. Carry Katz with King-10 suited opens to 13,000. Webster flats, and it comes King-5-3. Top two for Webster, top pair for Carry. Really bad situation for him. No slow play out of Webster as he check raises the 15 to 46. Carry makes the call, and now he hits bigger two pair on the turn. Webster firing 105,000. And Carry just deciding to flat. Now the river, a three. And Webster moving all in for 685, putting Cats in the blender. Could he possibly be thinking about a fold? 
Boy, it sure feels like a set of fives. Wow. Using time banks. And eventually, mucking the best hand. And therein lies the power of playing aggressively. I'm gonna wanna see that one. I folded a huge hand. You have six four? Six four? Eight, ace four? But yeah, I'll see you soon enough. The stakes are so enormous and people are making, I think, more money than they really need. The poker society, it's a lot of taking from other people and not that much giving. Poker is inherently a selfish game where we're not really produ producing anything. As opposed to a normal tournament where you pay your entry fee and it all goes to administration or the casino or wherever, uh, here the entry fee is just going to charity. 50,000 pounds per player, totaling like 2.7 million. That kind of money can really make a big difference in the world. It's a big part of why I'm keen to play the tournament. Being able to generate so much for charity is a personal achievement for me, it's a moral achievement for me, and I feel ecstatic about it gives meaning to what is otherwise a selfish but very fun thing. Here with Sam Triggett. Sam, how does it feel to be at this uh, glorious table of death, should we call it? Yeah, the words out of my mouth, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's good. It's challenging. It's not ideal. It's obviously the, probably the worst table in the room. And there's lots of big pots that I've been involved in that I didn't really want to be involved in uh, at this yes. point. And I don't know if you know this, but there's a total of 157 million in live tournament winnings at that table. And basically, you're all maniacs is what I'm saying. Yeah, there's a bunch of sickos on there, yeah. I mean, these are some of the biggest crushers. Uh, Jason Kuhn has won a lot of the tournaments here at the Tritons Series. Now, what's really cool about this tournament is that you get some of the old school pros too, like Sam Trickett. And what I really like about watching a table like that is that everybody has a skill, but because there's old school and new school, you're going to see a very interesting dynamic. Suited cards in the hijack for Chidwick, who opens to 13,000. He's dominated by Trickett's ace jack, which chooses to just flat, allowing Bryn Kenny to come along for the ride. 7 4 Trey, all clubs as Chidwick flops the jack high flush. Choosing to slow play. Round of checks. Now Trickett with the nut flush draw and top pair checks a second time. Chidwick still not wanting to bet it. Checked 16. behind again. Now the board pairs and Trickett fires 16,000. And Kenny with eight high, making it 102,000. Chidwick flats the 102. Obviously, Trickett knows this ace jack must have some real problems, but nevertheless, he moves all in over the top. And Chidwick folding the winner. So now the field's emerging. This means that you get a new table draw. You get to a new table. I, I can't even imagine if I was a pro and I would draw a tough table again, how that would feel in a million pound tournament. But I mean, for most of these guys, there's gonna be some spots at the table that they're really looking for. People that are a little bit less experienced. But I also think that a lot of the business guys that are playing do play a high stakes. And you know, they are more used to playing for these stakes sometimes. So I think that a few of them can really put a wrench in uh, their plans as well. So Talal, talk to me about the first six levels of play where you were just playing with the non-pros and now the merge is happening. Strategy-wise, are you going to be tweaking things? Uh, yeah, it will, be a, it will be a change. So it was interesting playing with the non-pros. Some of them are very good, but it tends to play differently to the pros. So you see more variants of styles and you have to adjust to individuals. So it's much, it's much more relevant who's making the bets and, and how they're acting. Than, than it would be on normally on a pro table. And also it's, mu it's much, much less aggressive, the play. You'll see a lot more bust outs now, not just because the blinds have gone up, but just because it's a more aggressive game. Dan Smith, flatting the Danny Tang open with his A6 suited. And Smith flopping the nut flush draw on a queen high board. As Big Al came along for the ride and has flopped an open ender. No C-bet from yeah. Danny. As he check folds, Smith and Big Al remain. Dan continuing to apply pressure. 125,000 pounds of it here. But Big Al 
not easily deterred, reaching for chips. And he wants to take a peek at this river, which pairs the board. And now he comes out firing with just king high. Getting Dan Smith off of the ace high busted flush draw and giving him a look as well. Despite the fact that half the field are non-professionals, many of these guys play a tremendous amount of poker. So as a professional poker player, we're all not playing the exact same way by any means. But there's a lot of fundamental things that you will commonly see professional poker players do. So if you're in the dark and you've never played with a good pro before and you sit down and play with them, you're going to have a decent idea of the way that they approach thinking about the game. But some of the non-pros uh, can be pretty tough to play against. There is a huge range of what they can do. Some of them are completely bananas. Some of them never want to take risk. You're just in the dark for 30 seconds and you could end up making a catastrophic mistake by calling against a guy who never bluffs or folding against a guy who's completely out of his mind. So it's, it's really fun to have to guess so much on this giant spectrum of where does this amateur stand? Pocket threes for Elton Sang, opening to 36,000 under the gun, and Perky with pocket tens in the small blind. That allows Bobby Baldwin to come along. Oh boy. Set over set against top pair, top kicker. Buckle your seatbelts. Perkins leading out with the stone nuts on this flop. Baldwin raising it up. Elton thinks he's got them both trapped with a flat call here, and now Perkins moving all in. Sang is thrilled to see this. Come on. Baldwin making the call. Come on. And Sang is going to move all in as well here. Holy shit. A monster pot developing with a side pot to boot. And Singh and Baldwin Aww. both getting a look at the disastrous news. <laughs> Queen on the turn leaves Baldwin drawing dead. One out for Zhang. He can't hit it. Perky eliminating Elton and winning a monster. To be honest, when I heard how big this event was going to be, there was a little part of me that's like, oh no, am I still going to be number one on the all time money list at, after this? You know, I've only had it for one year. but there are many people like Bryn Kenny or David Peters who could pass me either in this tournament or maybe through a small cash in this tournament. With 50 million pounds in the prize pool, um, if I end up winning it, I could end up as the all-time money winner, which uh, has always kind of been a goal of mine to someday reach, so that'd be you know, pretty exciting if I was able to do that. There's no doubt, there's no way that I'm not gonna be number one. You know, I cashed for $25 million last year. It just felt like a dream. It felt completely unbelievable. Basically, at the start of the year, there were three huge tournaments scheduled, and I won all three of them. It would just be nice if this happens. Probably nobody will ever, like, touch it again. It'll just be, like, off to the races from there. Never really give anyone a chance again. Always play the biggest buy-ins. If I got first in this, that would make it so much harder for anyone else to pass me. Nikki P with Jack-10 suited on the button. More than enough hand to open up. 125K to go, he says. Bonomo has an ace in the big, defends, and flops bottom pair up against top pair here. 90. Smallish continuation bet out of Petrangelo, 90,000. 335. And Bonomo electing to check raise, perhaps a product of that sizing, by Nick. He'll call. The total of 335. Six on the turn, and now Bonomo barrels once more, this time 600,000. Petrangelo calling again. No heart on the river means the flush draw didn't get there. And Bonomo going with this one, betting 1.375 on the end, but Petrangelo sniffs it out as he hangs tough with the Jack-10. And shows he will not be pushed around.
So in a poker tournament, normally 10 or 15% of the players make the money. And when you're on the edge, when, okay, if one more guy goes out, now we're in the money, that's called the bubble. The money bubble is always a pivotal part of any tournament. And this is going to be the biggest bubble of all time. The first instinct is to play super cautious, you know, make it so there's absolutely no chance to get knocked out. Uh, the big stacks have the opportunity to put pressure on the smaller stacks or the medium stacks and just accumulate more chips while everyone else tries to get into the money. But in some of these high rollers, what you want to pay attention to is how top heavy the payout is. If, you know, 50% of the prize pool goes to first place, then you should think a lot less about the bubble. And a lot of people have trouble doing that when it's a million for the min cash, maybe two million for the min cash. But if it's 20 million for first place, then you really have to try 10 times as hard to win first place. And I think a lot of people forget that when they're new to playing high stakes tournaments. I had a stretch a few years ago where I bubbled five out of seven super high rollers. And I would just show up to the biggest tournaments and then get near the money and have it not go my way. It definitely was taking a toll on me and made me doubt my confidence. Tilt is uh, when your reality does not match equal your expectations and it's significantly or below your expectations. It's so easy to just doubt yourself. This is part of the game. This is actually expected. And so you need to change your expectations. It's tough. It's very tough to be at the top of this game. Igor Kurganov with a couple of tens. Million. Oh, he's kidding. Very Moving all but 25,000 of his chips in there from the hijack. And a disastrous setup here oh for Kurganov God. as Perkins moving all in. Vivek and Big Hal getting a nice work. chuckle here. You look no, very happy. You have the stronger range here, then I'm not that happy. They both know, as does Igor, that Perkins' hand must be huge, yeah. considering That's he was willing to sail oh, his shorter wow. stack wow. in there wow. rather than sit back and let Igor Bill. potentially bust Correct. himself on this Good. bubble. I have jacks, he has 10. Reg has 10% free roll of me. Really? So sad, yeah. Big, I, I'll give him 10% free roll of me. No, you can't do that. That's Why can't I? That's, that's a lot. Take 1%. Jeez, whoa, 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 if you whoa, whoa, whoa. If you win it, I would love one, I would love 1% free roll. Okay, 1%. If you win it. All right, 1%. If you, Reg has 1%. All right, thank you. You got it. A sporting gesture from Perkins as he pledges 1% if he manages to win Wait, to Chris? Igor's charity. Oh, yeah. And you can tell who's ahead in the pot as Camp Perkins is all smiles and Liv is feeling the tension, perhaps even more so courtesy of this King Jack 5 flop. But hold on a minute. Backdoor flush and straight potential for the two tens now. Stop praying over there. Suddenly with many outs, can Igor hit a spade or a queen? No, it's a deuce and Perky doubles. So most often you bust out in a tournament, but I actually got to be so lucky to run deep in this event. And at 12 left, the direct bubble, I got it in against uh, my friend Bill Perkins. And not only did I want to win for myself because I'm now so close to the final table, but also the 10% that an effective charity would have received was huge. So it was a pretty big disappointment to lose, but the silver lining, and it's a big one, was that Bill decided to donate a chunk of his own action to a charity in case that he wins the hand against me, which he did, and ended up donating. I feel very fortunate to be in this position, to be able to play uh, in the, on the biggest final table in history. I try to go in like every day, just put your name on a bag, first day, second day, now final day. There's a lot of frustrations, there's a lot of victories, there's a lot of th lot going on during a poker tournament. All in. For the past 15 years, I put in more time to poker than anybody else. So now just to be able to take like last two, three years maybe where I just like take a breather, play the biggest games when I feel more like playing, and it's just, yeah, gone very well. Some bad beats, some losses, some frustrations, some angry at the world, why me moments. What you got? And then you have some elation and victory and like, wow, look at me. Yeah, there's definitely some expectations coming in since I have a, a, thir a third of the chips in play. Good fold. 
Just go in, hopefully play my A game, hopefully things go well, one or two things go well. Could easily happen and just do my thing and yeah, hope for the best. It would be very awesome to be the number one all-time winner. Like, by definition, there's literally only one. And when you consider the whole scope of poker and everything, that's pretty special. But again, it is poker. There is luck. You know, I have some pretty strong opponents, so I'm just going to just play it hand by hand. It certainly feels like a bit bigger of a stage than some of the others I've, I've been on. The final table in Jeju was like all really tough pros. This is a mix between some recreationals and some unknown pros and some top pros. So it'll just be a different mix, different field. At the same time, it's a pretty tough final table. You know, everybody has pretty big like poker accolades. It'll be a long day of battling. I want to enjoy every moment. I'm just really looking forward to it. Big Al and Dan Smith limping with ace three suited and two fives respectively. Timothy Adams with the two nines raised it up, shedding the fives, but not the ace three suited, which turns into a nut flush draw on this jack six four two diamond flop. Adams with a 450k C bet gets called. Board pairs on the turn. Adams not slowing down. As he bets 575,000. Big Al hangs in there. Board double pairs on the end. Come on. Adams does not fire the river, and that opens the door for Big Al to move all in. We saw him bully Dan Smith off of a winner earlier, and he does the same again here. I didn't even know if it was his turn. Showing the bluff. Ooh, Alfred DeCarlo. Shows the bluff. They don't call him Big Al for nothing. Alfred. Notch another W in the amateurs column. He's a, he's a pretty big gangster, man. Oh. Actually, I think he almost shoved out a turn. We might have to play the video I say, tape. what would Rick do in this spot? <laughs> Shove. So I couldn't help it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's the only way I could win the pot, right? I think anyone who's played poker at any point in their life will tune into a big event like this. There's something different about knowing everyone is watching where any of your moves will be seen by the entire world. Every poker player is going to watch the final table of this event, so it's maximum pressure, it's a huge audience, and you're going to be playing against the absolute best. Playing well or running well or making a bad decision will change your legacy. If you make a really big mistake in the biggest tournament ever, it's not something that people are going to forget. Vivek Rajkumar putting his big stack to work with Ace Jack. And Aaron Zhang deciding that he is ready to tussle as he moves all in with an Ace Jack of his own. Hey, no problem. I thought you should have 20 big buys, huh? 10 8 4 2 heart flop means Zhang is the only player who has the possibility of scooping this oh, thing. Little bit no, 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 no. And the heart on the turn means he can scoop with another heart on the end here as Vivek has a sweat and a disastrous run out. Aaron Zhang doubling up. Oh my God. Vivek with an ace eight now on the button. Opening to 450,000, sitting on 18 million. Chidwick flats. Flop's top pair on the Jack-9-4 rainbow board. Raj Kumar C bets 300,000, an easy call for Stevie. Gut shot straight draw for Vivek, picked up on the turn. And so he will barrel once more. 850,000 this time. Chidwick not ready to release. Calls a second barrel. Six doesn't change anything. All in. And the third check from Stevie draws an all in from Vivek, which Stevie calls. Big call there for his tournament life. Good on, Stevie. 500. Pocket jacks here for Smith. Makes it half a million to go and picks up Rajkumar, who hits top two pair. 
a great spot for him against the Jacks. As he check raises, Smith's 1 million chip C bet to 2.7. Smith moves it all in. Raj Kumar, snap calling. And he is a big favorite. Not the one I wanted. Safe on the turn, but a jack on the end. And Smith connecting and doubling, leaving Vivek with just five and a half million. Definitely stings, and I was feeling a little mopey, and then I went to go sign the paper. 7.2 million pounds is a lot of money. I think it's hard to keep your composure in the big moments when you're playing for, in this case, tens of millions of dollars, and I think I did a good job of that today. We're here in London, Raylene Bryn on the final table, heads up, he's about to win the biggest poker prize ever in history, 19 mil. He's got a four to one chip lead. It's amazing, and it couldn't be going to a more deserved person. You know, he's put his heart into poker. He's played since he was about 18. He's lost millions in staking. He's come back, bounced back. He's gone broke 20, 30 times. I mean, he was always at the top of the game, but now he's at the top of the echelon of the poker world. All right. So, I mean, that's what I always say. In tournaments, like, you never count yourself out. You could be last in chips, you win two hands, and now all of a sudden you're in third. Now all of a sudden you win one more all-in and you're in first. So, I mean, tournaments are all about endurance and just playing strong, keeping it together when things, like, go bad and just being able to, like, ride the roller coaster and take it. Bryn Kenny. Making it one million to go with the king queen. Aaron Zhang says, "Let's dance with two sixes." And the sixes hold for Zhang as Sensei unable to eliminate him. Kenny relentless here with nine deuce suited, opening to one point two. Zhang defends and flops, trips. He knows how aggressive Kenny is, checking to Bryn. Bryn with the seabed, and Zhang trying to reel him in here. On the turn, however, Kenny has picked up a flush draw. Zhang now choosing to lead out, and Kenny maintaining the aggression, raising it to 4.1. And you see Zhang just flats, fills up on the end, and now checks, giving Kenny rope. Slips the noose around his own neck with 4.85 million sitting on nine high as Zhang piles and takes it down. Top pair for Zhang here in a four and a half million chip pot. He bets two million. Kenny raises it up, sitting on the nut flush draw. Zhang says, let's go. Kenny is ready, and he cannot hit the flush on the turn or the river. And the amateur, Aaron Zhang, is your Triton Million Champion. Congrats from Richard Young and Paul Pua. Well deserved as Kenny left in second. I really love playing the Triton events. Uh, they add a level of prestige that you don't really see in any of the other events around the world. Even though Triton has pretty small field tournaments, it's found its spot in the poker ecosystem because there are a special amount of players that want to play the biggest stakes in the world. And they want the high-end experience, the high-end production, and they want to play the toughest players in the world. Um, they treat the players so well, whether it's you know the free hotel rooms, the pickups from the hotel, the free food. I love this whole series. I mean, exceptionally well run. Yeah, I have the best time here, no question. You know, other stops have high rollers, but Triton is only high rollers. You make me 
And just the atmosphere, it's so nice. It feels very exclusive. It feels very high stakes. It feels like what high stakes gambling should be. That's what's unique about it. You show up to one stop and you're like, okay, I'm gonna play a 50K, but then I'm gonna play a 5K main event or a 10K main event and then go home. Triton's like, we're gonna warm you up with a 50K and then you're gonna play 100K. And then maybe in the middle of the year, if you can pull it together, you're gonna to show up and play a million pound tournament, the biggest buy-in in the history of poker. That's what Triton is about, you know, just uh, setting the benchmark for everybody else.